right, our next speaker for, uh, for her first of two uh, coming from, uh, from Austria, um, Barbara Wondrash, uh, is going to talk about uh, prevention of cartilage injuries and later come back and talk about uh, rehabilitation. Barbara. So thank you, Scott. First of all, I would like to thank Philip for the invitation to come to Doha and to be part of this really fantastic um, event. And then I would like to thank the organizing committee for the perfect organization of this event. I hope you agree that after what we heard now from Matt, that the topic how to prevent cartilage injuries is quite challenging. And after showing my disclosure, I will go into detail. And when preparing this topic, I came up and said I will change the title and to the question, can we prevent cartilage injuries like you can see here. When we talk about prevention, and we knew a lot of from this topic from ACL patients, it's very important to look at first to incidents of cartilage injuries. And I just want to summarize what Matt just has shown us. One problem in cartilage injuries is that it's very difficult to ascertain the real incidence and prevalence as most of these cartilage injuries reside silent, at least at the beginning. So the data we have show us that we have a high incidence and prevalence of cartilage injuries, and in particular in the athlete um, sports people and in particular in football players. What about the etiology of cartilage injuries? We also heard a lot the last two days on this topic. And we know that the most um, common reason are acute traumatic injuries. So one way to prevent cartilage injuries is by that to prevent, of course, the trauma itself. It's contact traumas and non-contact traumas, mainly ACL injuries in the knee and meniscal injury. But we should not forget repetitive with microtrauma, with axial load, with shear forces, with shear and compression forces, ligamentous instability, malalignment, and also meniscal insufficiency. And all of these co causes have common that they in a kind influence the joint loading. And by influences joint loading, you will also influence the cartilage physiology by itself. I will come later to it. Now, what about the development of cartilage injuries? In most cases, it will start with partial sickness defects, which reside to the superficial layer. And in some patients, we might not see any clinical symptoms. So we might see these patients eventually, if we see them by chance, as a concomitant um, defect. Some of these patients might already exhibit some symptoms. The typical symptoms for cartilage injuries is pain effusion, sometimes locking and catching, leading to functional impairment. We do not know too much about the natural cause of these injuries, but many of these partial, partial sickness defects will progress to full sickness cartilage defects. And patients with this kind of defects, they will really show us the symptoms I have already talked about. If you don't treat this full sickness cartilage defects, it is well described that this might be the onset to the development of osteoarthritis, which involvement of whole joint and not only the cartilage structures. And also patients with osteoarthritis may exhibit these symptoms. So what are now possibilities to prevent cartilage injuries? I think we won't be able to prevent partial sickness um, defects, but I think we are able to prevent the progression from partial sickness defects to full sickness defects. And I think we are able to influence also the symptoms. And further, I think we can slow down the progression to, from full sickness cartilage defects to osteoarthritis. What are now strategies for preventing the progression of these injuries? Of course, surgical treatment. If we address instability, if we address malalignment, and if we address the meniscus which is impaired, then we might be able also to slow down the progression of the cartilage injury. There are non-surgical treatment options, adaption of lifestyle, which is in most cases not interesting for high athletic sportsmen, but we also have possibilities with rehabilitation. Actually, what is common to both or to all of these treatment options is that we try to optimize joint loading. And by optimizing joint loading, we might reduce symptoms and we might slow down the progression towards osteoarthritis. 
We heard yesterday a lot of the surgical, about the surgical treatment options, and so now I will address the rehabilitation part. When speaking about prevention and when speaking about rehabilitation in patients with cartilage injuries, it's very important to go one step back and to look to the physiology of radicular cartilage. We know we have chondrocytes. The chondrocytes are high active and they should be high active to produce the extracellular matrix. And it's in particular important to have a high number of proteoglycans, which are able to bind water and to make the tissue um, to withstand to compressive forces. We have four different zones, including a calcified layer. The nutrition is mainly via synovia, and that nutrition could really could take place. It's important that the signaling pathways are mechanosensitive. That means cartilage really needs movement. If we look to the function of cartilage, I always like to compare it with a bike body situation. See the bone as the rims, the spokes and the frames. See the muscles as the suspension for shock absorption. And I think this is very important if we treat patients with cartilage injury that we really aim to have a good muscle structure. The cartilage itself, it's the firm tire and works as a shock absorber. And the axle provides us a free friction movement. What happens now during a normal physiologic loading? I will later come to it what it is a normal physiologic loading. We have a matrix fluid flow, we have good nutrition, we have a motopolite removal, and very important, we have a tube-tie collagen gene impression, which is very important for the organization of the cartilage tissue itself. We have an increased proteoglycan synthesis, which is important that we have a high number of proteoglycans so that the cartilage is really able to tolerate the forces that are exerted on it. And we have anti-inflammatory effects, which is beneficial for the tissue. I just want to bother you now with all this signaling pathway. I just want to show you how complex and how complicated the process is when cartilage gets loaded. However, it's very important that this process can take place because cartilage needs movement. So during moderate mechanical loading, you have a good balance between stimulatory effects and inhibitory effects, and there can be take place a good matrix synthesis. However, what will ha happen if we, don't, if we have a non-physiologic joint loading? We have a high number of inflammatory cytokines leading to a catabolic joint response, leading to a cartilage damage. What are examples of non-physiologic joint loading? This could be on one side reduced loading, so immobilization and rest is also not an option for patients with cartilage lesions. And on the other side, it's overloading, for example, traumatic overloading or high-intensity loading. We have now spoken, when I spoke before, to the uh, theology of cartilage reasons. I showed you examples, the ACL injury, malalignment, and meniscus injury. And I showed you that mo many of these injuries might lead to a change joint loading. And we can compare a change joint loading to a non-physiological joint loading. So come back to this slide. If you now put this into some clinical data, what is good joint loading and what is a uh, not so good joint loading. We know that repetitive low impact athletics, it is described at five times body weight or lower. There we have no increase of the progression to OA and also the OA rate is decreased. And this is beneficial for the normal cartilage and for the degenerated cartilage, which we will really find in most of our patients after ACL, for example. On the other side, we know that intense high impact athletics this will lead to an increase of joint degeneration. It's about 10 to 25 times the body weight, and additional to the increased risk of joint degeneration, we find also an increased risk of acute joint injury. So what does this mean for the cartilage itself if a patient is exposed to high impact loading? We have an altered content of the cartilage components, in particular of collagen type 2 and proteoglycans. We have a cumulative damage of the cartilage. It's greater effects in joints who are abnormal loaded. We will find a cartilage fibrillation and very important, the proteoglycan content decreases and the pressure on the subchondral bone increases, increases, which is mainly responsible for the pain in these patients. In general, the function of the cartilage is 
decreasing and cartilage can't longer work as it should be. And in addition, we will find a loss of homeostasis. So what can we do now with this kind of patients? I think we can prepare on a very structural level the cartilage itself, but more important, we can prepare the patient for high impact loading. So what are now the three main components of non-surgical treatment options to influence joint loading? One is that really aim to maintain and restore joint homeostasis, which is very important that the metabolic waste can happen in the cartilage. We should emphasize lower limb in alignment and we should provide enough muscle strength and neuromuscular control for these patients. The first thing to address, to maintain and restore joint homeostasis, we know that cartilage really needs nutrition so that he is able to work. What can we do? What kind of modalities do we have? First of all, it's very important to mobilize the joint. Remember when we saw the slide of non-physiological loading, immobilization is really not a choice for this patient. We could include modalities like manual therapy. You should, you should um, perform active movements in unloaded position and also passive movements. There are a lot of studies showing that CPM has a high influence on the increase of proteoglycans. Aim to minimize shear stress over the joint, provide intermittent pressures and very important, give enough rest periods between your exercise sessions. The second thing, Cartilage does not like a situation like this. So cartilage does not like infusion. All this, all this biochemical pathway won't be, able, won't be able to take place in the way I showed you or the way it should be. Why? We know that effusion has a negative biochemical effect on the cartilage itself. We know from the muscle function that the quadriceps muscle will be inhibited. And very important, we will find a decrease in knee joint proprioception. This again will lead to changed movement patterns and to change forces acting on the knee. And again, we have the situation of a non-physiological loading in the joint. So try to address your effusion by minimi minimize loading activities, in particular if effusion is present. Reduce effusion before you start to train with your patient. You can use modalities like lymphatic drainage, kinesio taping, cryotherapy, or just simple rest. And in particular, intensive, inten, intensify low load exercises. Other way, provide joint circulation exercises and reduce load. Second thing which is very important is to emphasize lower limb alignment. If you have a patient like this, and we train with a patient like this in this position, this won't be beneficial for the cartilage. You find a poor proximal control, which is mainly due to weak core stability. You find an increased femoral internal rotation, which is mainly due to weak hip muscles. You find an increased tibular torsion and an increased foot pronation. Also leading to a non-physiological and in particular increased load, increased load in the knee. So this is a situation we re really would like to have. How can we get to this? Improve the core stability, emphasize neuromuscular function of the hip muscles, in particular by training of abduction and external rotators, and if necessary, use foot insoles. Another important factor is to provide muscle strength and neuromuscular control. In general, what are the role of the lower limb muscles? We need them for joint movements, for joint stability, but in particular, this is very important for cartilage patients for load absorption, to dissipate the forces that are acting on the tissue and in particular on the joint surface. If you find this function, it has been reported that it also leads to change loading patterns in the knee. We have an altered kinetics and kinematics in nip and heat joint. We will find an increased load on the cartilage and meniscus and it also influences the development and progression to OA. So increase strength of quadriceps and hamstrings, both hypotrophy and strength. And also include proprioceptive and neuromuscular skills. We know that motor learning plays an important role in these patients. So try to transfer your strength training in functional movements in close kinetic chains with axial load. Try to move throughout the entire range of motion and try to perform and provide different difficulties. 
Very important also train the movement quality before you increase the intensity, so before you use weight, so before you increase your weight. Perform short sets to reduce the creep effect and improve concentration. Avoid knee enduring landing. Again, this will lead to an increased knee load and avoid hyper extension. This is also not beneficial for the cartilage tissue. Before I come to my take home message, I just want to present you a study we were just performing in Austria. We get the funding for this. This is now not an athletic population, but this is another population who have a high risk of, um, of getting OA. And we want to evaluate the biomechanical effects of the strength and neuromuscular exercise program and lower extremity kinetics and kinematics in obese children. And I think that the problem of obese children is not only in Austria present, it's all over the world that we have to do with um, overweight children. And we also know from a lot of studies that overweight in combination with physical activity leads to anatomical and biomechanical malalignment in particular in the hip and in the knee. We have again increased loads and in particular overload of the intraanticular structures, which will lead to osteoarthritis. So our research question was, if a 12 weeks strength and neuromuscular exercise program for the lower extremity affect biomechanical parameters of the lower extremity during walking and stair ascent and descent in obese children and adolescents. We have now included 55 um, obese children and adolescents in the age from 10 to 18 years. We will evaluate biomechanical gait analysis using 3D gait analysis, joint moments and forces. And we will also evaluate the clinical status by an orthopedic status and questionnaire and blood, par blood parameters. The exercise include strength exercises for the lower extremity. It's two times per week for 12 weeks, and patients are also getting a home exercise program. And we already were able to publish this trial, uh, this trial protocol in the journal called Trial, so who is interested in it can find it on PubMed. So what is now my take home message for the question of the beginning of the talk, can we prevent cartilage injuries? I think we are not able to prevent it, however, we can slow down progression to osteoarthritis. We might be able to reduce symptoms related to the cartilage injury by identifying the risk population, by adapting lifestyle, and by optimizing joint loading. This can be done both surgically and non-surgically. If we prefer the non-surgical way, try to maintain, to maintain or restore joint homeostasis emphasize lower limb alignment, and provide enough lower limb muscle strength and neuromuscular control. Thank you very much.